Hello everybody. I will start on time because I have a lot of things to show you. The goal for me today is to explain some dark sides of the blockchain cryptography, things that people believe are very something uh, like um, mathematical side or they believe, for example, that encrypting a message is just take your key, take your message and involve the encrypt, encrypt function. I'll show you that it is far, far more complex than this. And I will explain that security and when you're dealing with wallets, with cryptography, with the elliptic curves and uh, AES depends on some parameters you give for these functions. And I'll talk also about the HMARC, the BIP39, BIP44, the hierarchical key derivation and generally the developer's perspective to this cryptography. I'm not cryptographer, I'm not a mathematician but I know very well how to use this technology. My name is Svetlin Nakov and I'm a blockchain engineer and a trainer from Bulgaria. This is in Eastern Europe and I'm involved in software development for the last 25 years and I write books, I train people, I do many, 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 many things. Just Google me and you'll see. I have three successful tech education startups which are quite successful with hundreds of thousands of students already trained in software engineering, programming, digital skills and many, many other things. And currently I run this software university which is the, the largest training center in Eastern Europe uh, where we have hundreds of thousands of students and we create software engineers. But the next thing is that I'm involved deeply in the crypto industry. I was part of a startup, crypto startup called Blockchain. This is a booking.com or Airbnb in, in a decentralized fashion. It raised something like 10 million in September to November and now it, it has a working product. Not fully decentralized, but it works today. Uh, I was the head of education of this Academy School of Blockchain, which raised a lot of millions, uh, and uh, now I'm working for SoftUni and several other blockchain crypto startups. But this is not the, the main goal here. The main goal here is to talk about cryptography, elliptic curves, concepts like the SEC-P256 K1 curve, how to derive from private key to public key to blockchain address, how to sign transactions and verify transactions in Ethereum, how to extract the public key from a signature in Ethereum, which is not uh, obvious because blockchain transactions don't have a public key. And if you are familiar with public key keys, you know that you need the public key to verify the signature. This is one of the strange things that I found when I started to um, find out how, how this technology works. I will talk very little about hash function because you know them. I will uh, explain the HMAC and key derivation functions like PBK, DF2, Script, Argon2 and many others which are deeply involved in the way your wallet is stored in your hard disk or somewhere else. Uh, because people believe that wallets are just encrypted. It's far different. Wallets are encrypted involving many, many, many algorithms with certain parameters and one wrong parameters may lead that your wallet will be decryptable, will be easy to crack. So that's why I want to explain these things in bigger details. So the next thing that I will mention are the crypto wallets and their standards, things like JSON UTC format. This is the format used in MITRE wallet, the BIP39, BIP44 standards, which define how to derive hierarchically from certain entropy uh, sequence of public and private key pairs over the elliptic curve field. So finally, I will explain the AES, which combines the S-script, the HMAC key derivation, the uh, uh, the HMAC um, message authentication codes. Uh, I will talk about padding, the chiffer block uh, modes, and, and few others. So my goal is just to make you more aware of what happens in, when you write a crypto 
software which interacts with the blockchain. What, what happens when you use some libraries like NBitcoin? I just include the NBitcoin library and tell it, please sign this message. But what inside? Is this correct? Does it work? Well, why we have a compressed public key? Why we have two blockchain addresses, for example, two, block, two bit count addresses from the same key? And this happens because you can uh, derive the key by using the compressed key, public key, and you can derive the blockchain address using the full um, public key. This will be the things that I will talk about today. And first of all, how many of you are developers? Well, most of you. How, how many of you are not technical guys? Wow, it will be boring for you. You maybe didn't heard so much strange words at the same place, but okay, try to get the most for you. So I'll start with the elliptic curve cryptography. This is uh, something related to math, but it's pretty easy if you think as a developer, if you think just as a multiplication of integer numbers. These are not, I don't think this is hard math. So I will explain in brief what is an elliptic curve, what is the, the elliptic curve cryptography, and how it is applied to calculate these ECDSA signatures, how we send messages, how we verify messages, and things like that. I'll start with the public key cryptography because elliptic curves are a tool to implement the a public key cryptography system. The public key cryptography uh, relies on a public key and private key which comes as a mathematically connected pairs and we can use the private key to sign messages and to encrypt messages and we can use the public key to verify the signature and to decrypt. In fact, in encryption, you can encrypt, encrypt either by public key or by private, and you always decrypt with the opposite pair of these keys. So it depends on the intention you have. When you sign messages, you always use your private key, which is uh, stored in your uh, wallet or in a hardware device, or it's managed securely, and you can verify the signature with the public key. Usually, this public key comes along with the message or can be derived from the, not with the message, but the signed message. So this is, these are the basic concepts which are not for technical people. Uh, this is something that you need to know if you use blockchain or if you have a wallet and things like that. But next, let's dig deep a little bit more technically. We have several public key crypto systems. The first massively used one is this RSA. Uh, developed in the MIT University is based on the uh, algebraic structure of discrete algorithms. This is something like modu modular exponents and some math with them. The elliptic curves are, and elliptic curve cryptography, ECC, is based on elliptic curves, which are some points in, the, in a matrix, and I will talk about them later. But the interesting thing is that RSA crypto system is several times weaker than the elliptic key curve cryptography crypto system. It's proven mathematically that a key of RSA of this size have the same cryptography strength than the 256-bit uh, elliptic curve key, which means directly that on the blockchain, if you want to have the same cryptography strength, your signatures, your keys will be longer, which means that the miners will need to have bigger hard drives and more, and more uh, space to keep the transactions. That's why people, most crypto systems on the blockchain use this elliptic curve cryptography, elliptic curve signatures, elliptic curve based uh, crypto cryptography um, utilities and ways to handle the signature. So, for example, Bitcoin, Ethereum, EOS, all they use this elliptic curve cryptography and uh, more precisely the SECP256K1 curve. Because in the elliptic curves we have many curves, some of them have good cryptographic properties, some of them less, they have different key length size, Etc. Etc. But be warned that the elliptic curve cryptography as a concept is not quantum safe. 
which means that if we have a quantum computer, when Peter sends to Maria five bitcoins, if you have the transaction, which is on the ledger, on the public block explorer, you will be able, using a quantum computer, to derive the private key from a signed message. And this is proven by cryptographers. But still we, don't, we are far away from this technology, or at least we believe we are. Maybe the military uh, already have it. Who knows? OK, so let's explain a little bit the, this elliptic curve cryptography, ECC. It's a public-private key crypto system, which is based on the algebra of the elliptic curves over the so-called finite fields, which is just a matrix. So they require small, smaller key size than RSA, significantly smaller, for the same security strength. Elliptic curves look like this. Cryptography doesn't, look, uh, doesn't use exactly these curves. They use their discrete mapping over affinite fields. Uh, this is, the elliptic curve is just an equation of third, uh, what's in English? Equation like this, of third power, okay? So, for example, Bitcoin uses exactly this equation, but it is on by module, like I will show you on the next slide. So, this is the basic uh, mathematics over this. If we have a public key, it will be some point here, or some point here. This is a public key. This is what you have in your, uh, when you sign messages, when you verify signature, Elliptic curves uh, uh, provide that public keys are points. So the elliptic curve cryptography uses the elliptic curves over a finite field called FP, where this P is a prime number. But this P is something which uh, has hundreds of digits. This is 256 uh, bits of size. This is a big integer. So. Uh, the elliptic curve is a set of integer uh, coordinates, like these blue points here, on a matrix. Uh, imagine we have a matrix of size 17 by 17, like this one. And imagine we have this equation. So the set of points y and x, which uh, are, uh, are on this equation, for example, this point and this point and this point, these are the possible values in this system. Like uh, in the finite field of the natural numbers, the numbers are 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. And we cannot have a, uh, another number. Here, the numbers or the elements in this structure are these points. So this is how it works. When we uh, do a signature, we obtain another point. But imagine what happens when it is not by module 17, but by module of 2 to the power of 256. Something very, very, very big number. So this is this number multiplicated by another this number. This is the size of the matrix. It's so huge that the chance to find a certain point there by chance is less than a meteorite comes and destroys the Earth. The chance the Earth to be destroyed is better than you to guess just by guessing the private key of some Bitcoin milliardaire, for example, a billionaire. Oh. Okay, so how does this math work behind? We have a point G, which is called the generator point. It is just a constant. It's a hard-coded number, X and Y coordinate. When we multiply it by a secret number of K, it moves to another point, because when it moves to the right, it starts from the left. This is the property of the module, you know, uh, mod n. When we have this equation uh, mod, by module n, when by module 17, if it is 19, for example, it will move from the right to the left. This is the, the normal property. If you are familiar with Gelb development, you know that when you move too many to the right, the, the spaceship, for example, comes from the left. So. The, the concept of this uh, elliptic curve cryptography used, for example, in Bitcoin and in Ethereum, 
It says that we have a generator point, and when we multiply this by certain number k, which is of size 256 bits, or maybe less, but it's a very big number, which is unlikely to be just guessed by trying, 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 uh, you obtain a new number, p. And they have defined the mathematics and algorithms behind this, and the, the point p stays on the same curve. So the k is called a private key. So the private key in the elliptic curve cryptography is just a random number from zero to the max to the size of this matrix. That's all. This is these are the all possible private keys. So when we multiply the private keys by this uh, point G, the generator, which is constant, just few numbers hard coded in the source code, we obtain a, another point X, Y, P, which is called the public key. And the interesting point is that we have very fast algorithm to multiply point by number, but the opposite operation caused dividing, division, uh, or the reverse operation of elliptic curve point multiplication is not possible. It's extremely slow, just like the integer factorization used in RSA. So if some mathematician finds a fast way to do this operation, he will be really rich, honest, and uh, very, very famous. So the next thing is just to write some code. We can use Python. I believe most of you are familiar with, with Python and can read Python code. We install a pcoin library. We include some this point. This is elliptic curve point and this curve FP, which is the curve. And we can define our curve, this one, which was from the picture of the previous slide. And we can print it and we can say that if the point, the generator point is this one, it should stay on the curve. Uh, if we multiply it by 0, 1, 2, 3, 6, we will obtain certain results. And the results are this. If we multiply by 0, we go to the infinity. If we multiply uh, g by 1, it's the same uh, point g. If we multiply by 2, it moves to another location. This is the multiplication is just moving one point, one possible point to another possible point. Just like when you multiply two integers, you obtain a new integer. And it stays in the system in the set of all possible integers. Here we use not integers, but points. And this increases the security uh, cryptography strength. So important thing which you will need to know if you write blockchain applications is the concept of compressed public keys. The compressed public keys comes from the fact that this curve, which is something like uh, this one, maybe this one, it's like this. It has some integer coordinates and some coordinates which are not integer. These which are not integer are not important. They are not used. The integer coordinates could happen only to have two points at the same vertical or just one point at certain vertical or zero points at certain vertical. It's proven mathematically. So if you have the x coordinate, the mm, how, how much on the right this point stays, you can have uh, only one or two points on this vertical. So instead of using 512 bits, you can encode a public key in just 129 bits. This is how. The public key can be compressed as x coordinate and one bit which shows whether the y coordinate is the odd or the even one. So if we have this equation, which is, which is the elliptic curve equation, we can use it to extract uh, the, by using module square root. We have some fast algorithm to do module square root. You can extract the y coordinate. What does it mean more practically for the developer? I will show you on some of the next slides. But uh, let's talk about a little bit more uh, about this equation. This is not cryptography powerful equation because it's, the field is too small and you can try all possible points. So th this would be all, all possible public keys and you can uh, try many. It's not strong. 
So people uh, use the so-called elliptic curve cryptography domain parameters. These domain parameters uh, are a set of constants which define which is the equation, which is the base point, which is the order, and many other things. And for example, in the Bitcoin, the size of the field is this one. This is the size of the field by x and by y. So it's a square of this. It's a matrix of this size uh, so in, in Bitcoin. They use this curve called SecP256K1. And this curve is used also in Ethereum and also in the EOS system. Some bit blockchain systems use different curves, like EDDSA250. But we will focus on Ethereum today because it's most widely used by developers. So these things are well described in this document, which comes from the US government, from their commission for, I, I'm not sure, for cryptography. And it says that we have many curves, like this one, SecP256K1. But we have also this curve, which is far, which has back far bigger cryptography strand because its keys are of this size, 521. And they describe just the parameters. For example, for this curve, the parameters are this. This is P. So how this matches in your code is just a constant in your Python code, for example, or in Java code. OK, it's not so interesting. Now let's have some more practical things. In Ethereum, the private key is this. I believe most of you are familiar with this. If you're not, I'll just uh, show you the, this uh, mnemonic code generator, and I will just generate some keys, and we'll show you an example. This is an example of public key. This is an example of private key, but it's encoded in the Bitcoin standard. I will switch in Ethereum. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Maybe my size is, is too big Bitcoin. Ethereum is, works better. So in Ethereum, the, it's the same in exactly the same cryptography. This is how a private key looks like. It's just a 256 bits of random bits. It should be random or it should be at least unpredictable. Maybe not random, but unpredictable. Uh, and from this key, we can derive the public key. I will show you how. And this public key, see its size. It starts from 0, 3 or 0, 2, which means that it is a odd or even Y coordinate because this key is compressed. So if we have this key, it's exactly 32 bytes which means that it's 256 bits. This is the secret kept in your crypto wallet. If you send bitcoins to someone, you have a secret number like this, and it is used to sign your transactions. This secret number can be transformed by multiplying this the above number to the generator point G, which is just a constant number, and you obtain 64 bytes. 212 bits. And this key can be expressed or compressed as the this key at the bottom. Because the Y coordinate, we don't need it fully. We just need to know whether it's odd or even. You will see this in all crypto libraries related to elliptic curves, related to Bitcoin, to Ethereum, to EOS, everywhere in the blockchain. So you now know what is a, or have known previously, what is a compressed public key. But I believe this is important. The next thing is the digital signatures and the blockchain addresses. How the blockchain addresses are derived. The blockchain addresses in Ethereum are 20 bytes. And how they come is this is, we get the private key, extract the public key, and this is the full public key. The not comp non-compressed, 64 bytes. And we hash it using this ketchup uh, 256 hash function, which is, in fact, the SHA-3, SHA-3, uh, with some 
little modifications. Okay, and we take the last 20 bytes, which means, in fact, that if I generate a random private key and you generate a, another random key on your laptop, it can happen that we have collision and we have the same blockchain address. It might happen. It might happen that by chance you have the same wallet like someone else and you can spend someone else's money. This is how it works. And we accept this because the chance to have this is uh, 2 to the power uh, 20 bytes by 8 bits. This is the chance. Uh, the chance is 1 divided by this. This is the chance to have the same wallet like the, some Bitcoin billionaire and to have the chance to spend his money. So in this example, we have capital uh, letters which incorporate a, hash sum, a checksum. To, if you mistake for one letter, the checksum will fail to calculate, so you will know that your blockchain address will be wrong. This is described in EIP-5055 standard for Ethereum. Digital signatures in this crypto system, SEC-P256K1, in this curve, uh, uh, consist of 64 bytes, in fact. They are a pair of this number R and S, and this number R should be random, and there are lots of cryptography attacks which try to predict this random number, and there were successful stolen money from Bitcoin network due to uh, failure of the Android random generate and many others. So the RFC 6979 standard explains how to generate this random number S, uh, R, and how to calculate this S in order to create the signature in a way that there is no more easier way to decrypt or to fake the signature than just to try all possible private keys, which are a lot. So we can play a bit with this. Uh, there is a Python library called ETH keys, and we can start from a private key from the previous example and to extract the public key. Uh, this is a built-in functionality in this library and compress it. How do we compress it? We take the public key, the Y coordinate is at its end, so if it is odd, we add 0, 2. If it is even, we add 0, 3. And these are the prefixes. So in Ethereum, the compressed keys consist of 66 hex digits, which is 33 bytes, which is a little bit more than uh, the smallest possible. And they calculate this checksum address. I will try, wow, I didn't expect this. Something happens with the, mm, OK, I'll fix it. I have experience. I need, no, no, I'll go to the display settings. Uh, graphics say, no, WMP. Ah, it's just, I needed to duplicate my screen. Nothing serious, but this happens sometimes. You should be ready. I, I want a speaker who has a video of all this presentation in case his computer crashes upon it in the cloud. <laughs> so, uh, no problem. I wanted just to, to give you some uh, of this code. Uh, sorry for this will slow down us a little bit, but this is the code. So we obtain this address from this, uh, from this case. I don't have enough time, but I have already uploaded all my slides in the shed of this uh, in the profile, in the description of this talk at the conference website. So uh, the Ethereum sig signature, they generate a random point R, which is generated deterministically according to this RFC 6979, uh, which is uh, internet standard. Maybe you know about these RFCs, which describe HTTP and many other uh, standards. So Ethereum signatures are different, uh, slightly different than the standard XP. SECP-256K1 signatures because they add an additional number called V, which just explains whether the public key is odd or even uh, because they want, if you have the message, to be able to derive the public key used to sign this message. So if you have Ethereum signature 
from the signature, you can extract the public key used during the signing process. And this public key is verifiable across certain blockchain address. So if you have the signature, you can check whether certain blockchain address have signed this message. And I will show you the signature is 130 hex digits, which is 65 bytes. So the key thing here is that the public key is not part of the signature, but it can be calculated. The private key, of course, cannot be calculated unless you have strong enough quantum computer, which are believed to not exist today. So this is an example like where we have a private key, we sign a message, and we obtain the signature. And the signature is just this 130 hex digits. I will not run this. It works in Python because my screen may be lost. So the interesting thing is that there is a at Etherscan, do you know Etherscan? Where the transactions for Ethereum are tracked? Okay, if you have the blockchain address, if you have the signature 130 bytes, and these are 20 bytes, and the message, the signed message, you can verify this. If you try to verify something wrong, it will fail. If I put this, if I put this, and if I intentionally tamper the message, uh, for example, I say 5,000K, it will say, oh, sorry, it's not valid signature. This is how Ethereum works. Bitcoin works in a very similar fashion, but the blockchain addresses are encoded in the base 58 encoding and look differently. They are not hex digits, but different digits. And most blockchains have some prefixes, six, uh, to uh, disambiguate between uh, some private keys, public keys, signature, they have prefix. Public keys have some prefix P, for example, etc., etc. So this is how we can verify a signature. If you have the message, if you have the message signer, if you have the signature, we can recover the public key from the message, which is Ethereum-specific, and I'm not sure that this exists in all blockchains, but this is how Ethereum works and you can extract the blockchain address of the message signer. And if the blockchain address of the message signer is the same like uh, the, mes the signer who uh, claims to, to sign this message, it's correct. So if you have signature, you can extract the blockchain address of the person who have made this signature. This is the, in short. I'll talk a little bit about hash functions because this is not the most interesting part, but it's part of all the cryptography. So what you need to know for the hash functions is that they take some text or some data and they uh, perform some calculation and get a hash of fixed size. For example, 256 bits. And it is one-way function. In cryptography, we use one-way functions, which means that it is almost impossible to recover the initial text from the hash, and also it's almost impossible to find another text message, different text message, who has the same hash, which means that it is collision-resistant and infeasible to invert. It's believed that most modern cryptographic hash functions are strong enough and it's not possible to tamper signatures. For some signatures like SHA0, uh, there is an online calculator. I will not talk about MD5 because it, it should be forbidden for totally. Uh, but these functions are old and don't use them. They have collisions. They have a way that someone can trick you and change the message, the signed message, and the signature will stay the same. There is an online demo for signing P PDF and modifying them and signing again and having the same signature. So SHA2 is a strong family of functions, uh, which has 256 bits or 512 bits variants, and SHA3 is 
who is considered one of the most strongest hash functions. It's also known as Hachak. In fact, Hachak is the SHA-3 uh, function uh, with different config parameters, different constants inside. And TRIPMD160 is still used in Bitcoin, that's why I mention it, and in the PGP system. And Bitcoin addresses are taken by using this, or calculated using this function. It's still strong enough. We have other cryptographically strong functions, like the Blake family of functions, which are also not still broken. And as of September, as of today, uh, there are no non collisions for SHA-256, which means, in fact, that if you hash a certain file or document, you may consider that the hash uniquely identifies it. So people believe that transactions have unique hash. In, practically, the hash is not unique, but the chance to, to find the collision is less than the chance a meteorite comes and destroys the Earth. So people believe hashes are unique. For example, the IDs in the IPFS decentralized system, the most widely used uh, decentralized storage system, use the hashes of documents to address the, these documents, which means that people don't consider that collisions are possible. If you have two different documents, you have two different hashes. The first person who finds a collision of some of these functions will become famous. This didn't happen still. Okay, so brute forcing to find the collisions due to some cryptographic properties uh, takes this time. For SHA-256, it takes half of the key length, numbers of attempt, until you find the collision. So if you have a uh, quantum computer, it will take even less. It's the key size divided by three, and this raised uh, to two raised to this power. But this is not the most important thing. Uh, you should know that hashes are quantum resistant, generally. If, you, if quantum computers come, we'll just increase the key length, and that solves the problem. This is not true for digital signatures. We should use different cryptographic system like one port signatures, like what is based signatures and many others. Calculating functions is not so interesting, so I will not show you the demo, but generally the hash is something like this. And you have seen this many times at Etherscan, at the blockchain explorers where you browse the transactions. Okay, few words about HMAC and key derivation. What is MAC, HMAC and key derivation functions? HMAC is something like a hash, which includes some kind of salt, some key. It combines a, some key with some message, makes some transformation, and obtains a hash. The simplest possible uh, is to have some hash of message plus some uh, key, just, for example, text, vertical line, and another text, and to hash this. This is not cryptographically secure. It's easy to find collisions for this scheme, so it's not used. Use HMAC. HMAC means that I have a secret key, I have a message, I calculate HMAC, and it's, it takes me some, gives me some number. It's used for integrity check, which means that if I encrypt my hard drive with some password, how should I know if I decrypt it with incorrect password that this password is incorrect? I can have a hash of certain file on my hard drive, uh, drive, and if I derive HMAC with the password and the hash of this file, and I saved this HMAC, it can be used to check whether my password was correct or not. Or not. This is how crypto wallets check whether your password is correct, is correct or not. Because when you write incorrect password, it says, oh, this is not your password, right? If you enter your correct password, it decrypts correctly. How do they know that this is not your password? If you decrypt uh, um, something with incorrect key, you will retur be returned some random data, unreadable data. So another important thing in cryptography are these key derivation functions. These are functions which transform a password to certain key, like HKDF or PBKDF to 
Script or Gontu and many others. This, the latest few are the modern KDF functions, which guarantee that if you have some password, it will be very hard for someone to find your passwords just by guessing, but by brute force. Uh, using just hash of your password, it's something which is very uh, easy to attack. So HMAP calculation should be something very simple. You have the key, we have the message, you have some hashing algorithm, and you get the digest, and you obtain something like this, something similar to hash. So we can use S script. S script is a strong cryptography function which performs many iterations, many computations to main brute forcing hars. Which means that if you choose good parameters for S script, it will be very hard uh, to guess your password. For example, if you if S script is not well configured, it will need, for example, attacker can try one million passwords per second. If this is well configured, the attacker could try 10 passwords per second. So if you have small password, it will be impossible to hack it even if it is small. So it is bound to memory. It consumes a lot of memory to be, to, so it is specially designed to be hard to be, to create a minor ASIC machine hardware, which is, makes calculate these hashes very fast. And today, Argon2 is, is considered better, but it highly depends on the parameters. I mean, that S script does not mean that your key uh, passwords are kept secure. It means that it might be secure if the parameters are good and it needs a lot of RAM, for example, within gigab one, one gigabyte, this will work well. So this is an example how this uh, can, can work. It's, uh, you need some salt. This salt is saved in the, in the wallet, in the encrypted wallet as well. And I will demonstrate you this in live. So I will mention very uh, a little bit about keys and how the blockchain addresses work. So we have wallet. Wallet keeps usually a master key, seed. This key seed comes from these mnemonics, these 12 or 24 words. It, it can extract private key or several private keys. Usually one wallet have multiple private keys inside. From the private key, you can calculate the, pu the public key. I already showed you this is just a multiplication on the elliptic curve. And from the public key, you can uh, extract the address. This is some kind of hashing and some other transformation. If you have a transaction, it can be signed by a private key which comes from the wallet. And the signed con transaction consists of signed data and the signature and these three components of the signature. And from them, you can extract the public key and you can verify that this public key matches the address, the blockchain address of the person who claims to uh, be the author of this transaction. So the signed transaction can be verified by a blockchain address. If you have transaction and address, you can check true or false whether the signature is valid. In the blockchain, we keep private keys in encrypted. For example, this is the format. We, this is a typical wallet used in Ethereum, in Miter wallet. Do you use Miter wallet? This is the way it keeps. So what's inside? It's the Schiffer text, it's the Schiffer algorithm, it's the key derivation function, and see its parameters of these key derivation functions, like the salt, and this is the MAC. This MAC helps to, to see whether, when you decrypt your wallet, whether the, your password was correct or not. Okay, so we sometimes use these HD wallets. HD wallets, like I already demonstrated, generate some words, for example, 24 random words, and this is what is held in your wallet, usually, in this hierarchical deterministic HD wallets, or hardware wallets, this ledger and Trezor hardware. So from this one, they extract this one. From this one, they extract some root key, and from them, they derive these keys and addresses. So you hold this address, and this address, and this address, and if you need more, uh, the wallet generates the next, the next, the next, just by increasing uh, this last number and calculating some things. So there are many things about this. It's, it's highly technical. It's just a series of HMAC computations and transformations, but everything starts from these seed words. So modern wallets use these seed words, and in fact, if you calculate, these words come out from this dictionary. They are 
2084 different words. These are all possible words. They are selected by some special properties, but one word is 11 bits of entropy, 11 bits of randomness. So 24 words uh, gives you a key length of size 264 bits. This is the secret in your wallet. And based on this secret, to this entropy, all your keys are derived uh, later. So the last thing I want to show you is the AES. Many people believe that AES encryption is just give me a password, give me a, uh, give me a secret, give me a message, give me a password, and it produces something. It's far different than this. AES uses a, a secret key, it's, uh, but it's a combination of many algorithms. First, the encryption algorithm, symmetric encryption, like AES-128 or AES-256. There are some other, OK, oh, I have only five minutes. So it's a block shifter, and when you use a block shifter, there is modes of operation. Some of them are not secure, and there are known attacks where it will be possible to decrypt your message if you don't use, uh, for example, CBC or CTR. There is an initial vector which should be random. If your random generator is not good, AES is not secure. In fact, you cannot have cryptography if you don't have secure random generator. That's why some wallets say, tell you, please move your mouse, write your name, write something here. They collect entropy to initialize their random generator to be secure. Because if you don't have random, you don't have uh, AES, you don't have encryption. Use CBC or CTR mods, these are uh, considered mm, the best. And we have also padding algorithm, because AES works on block. It takes the first 256 bits, encrypts them, and takes something. Transform your key, takes the next portion of 256 bits, encrypt them, and output something changes the key by some transformation and again and again and again like this and they path if you have just five letters to to encrypt it will be padded with some special characters uh, to to be encrypted later in block by block we have password derivation functions like s script used there and we have map so what's inside this is uh, some code but uh, you can play with it, which demonstrates how you can use S-Script in Python. But the most interesting thing is what's in your wallet. OK, so in your wallet, you have something like this. You have the shifter text. You have the shifter, which is the shifter algorithm. You have the initial vector. You have these S-Script parameters, which here, they are not strong enough. These parameters are not very good, but they work well in the browser. That's why they are selected. I uh, recommend use better, uh, better parameters and also using Argon2. This is what is inside. Uh, this is the code which implements this. But if you go to my Ether wallet, you will see that if you generate, hey, if you generate a new wallet, you can take this one. And I can show it inside. So this is the AES. Exactly this things. So now you can know what is MAC. This MAC guarantees that when you enter a wallet, a password and decrypt your wallet, if this MAC is correct, your password was correct. If it's not correct, it's, this means incorrect password. This is the key derivation function, S-script. This might be Argon2 or different key derivation function with different number of iterations. So thank you for listening to me. I hope this was interesting to you. Maybe we have time for just one question or two. And I will be around. And I'm open to talk with you additionally after the talk. So you, you can ask many questions. Additionally, some questions at the last. Um, uh, since it's a fully, uh, since it's a fully uh, uh, encrypted wallet, uh, can you In fact, uh, in fact, there, 
the, the programming language does not play the role here. Uh, most implementations are written in C, in plain C, not C++, and highly optimized. They have assembly code in, in line. And if you use JavaScript, they have bindings to these C libraries. In fact, the, the libraries of the Bitcoin, they use this curve sec p 256 k one because it is fast. It's not the best, the, the best curve from the cryptographic perspective, but it can be optimized to be very, very fast. And most people just take it. For example, in Java, you usually take a binding to C to the same library. So it you may assume that all languages use mostly the same code, like OpenSSL, some bind to OpenSSL. And if you have a book in OpenSSL, the earth is uh, ending. <laughs> you, you have seen this, like the SSL problems a few years ago. Yes? Suppose I wanted to uh, have a different kind of account in, um, on a Ethereum blockchain and use a different, like a bilinear character based key algorithm. How difficult would it be to do that? To, to change the algorithm in Ethereum? To change it, but to add another one. To, to change the signatures? Right. Or what? Yeah, right, right. Uh, yeah. If we want to change the algorithm for signatures in Ethereum, it would need a hard fork, which means that it will be changed. It will be something like they have a transaction. In the transaction, it says, the first byte says, for example, this is transaction of type 1, or type 2, or type. It will be the next one, type 25. And when it is 25, why like just file for months? Yeah, you can give version 1, version 2. Yeah, they will change it. And the new nodes, the old nodes, will not recognize it. So sometimes it might be soft fork. Soft fork means that the old nodes will ignore the new transaction. Uh, and sometimes it's a hard fork, an incompatible change. So hard forks means that the Ethereum uh, Foundation says, I announce a new algorithm, it is, for example, quantum safe, etc., etc., etc. Please update your software. But some miners will update their software, some will not. And, the, and it will split. If most of the miners upgrade to the new version, this is just a new version of Ethereum. If, mo if some of the miners stay on the old, it is just the scenario with Ethereum and Ethereum Plus. This is the way we upgrade decentralized system. You should to convince all the participants to upgrade their software. Okay, thank you. I'm again. I'm around here, and I'm open for your additional questions. So thank you for being at this talk. <laughs>